started? Yeah, I'll introduce, I mean, I'll just introduce for those people who don't know what On Point Nutrition is or who we are, um, because I know we have, we've kind of opened it up to everybody, which is great. Um, So we're from On Point Nutrition. Lisa is here as our special guest for our webinar tonight. Um, On Point Nutrition is a virtual nutrition counseling practice, and we do a lot of lifestyle change. Actually, we do only lifestyle change, habit change, all of that good stuff around either weight loss, improving your relationship with food, and or any type of nutrition-related diseases. We do it all. Um, and yeah, that's my that's my intro for On Point. And now I'm, I'm going to introduce Lisa, who is our special guest tonight. And you're, you're on, and you're, you are muted. Oh, oh okay. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I'm sure going to give you the floor introduction. Wonderful. I will take it from here. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I've actually given about four other presentations so far to On Point, and I've loved it every single time. I really appreciate the, the general vibe and engagement. So um, yeah, for people who are popping in, feel free to Let me know where you're from. Emily says the default seems to be chatting just to panelists, FYI. I think that's actually um, uh, nature of the webinar. Um, Maybe we can work on that for next time. But thank you, Emily. Thanks for letting us know. We're still testing out webinar versus regular Zoom and what the difference is. So I appreciate it. Well, I am going to share my screen and get us started because I got a lot of PowerPoint slides and lots of things to get through, but I would love to get us started with a question of what brings you here today? What are you hoping to accomplish in our webinar around high performance habits? So feel free to pop that into the chat box while I share my screen. There we go. All right. Now, can we see can we see my screen? The high performance habits. Thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous, fabulous. And I'll pull up the chat box. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you. All right. So today's webinar is high performance habits: the five secrets to building better habits. And actually, as I was reviewing the the slides and going through my own presentation, I realized that there was a lot of things that we can cover as far as high performance habits and what that actually means. Like, what does it mean to be a high performer? What does it mean to build better habits? And now more than ever, habits, everyday habits are so, so important with what's going on with quarantine and the pandemic getting habits to stick. That's so important. How do we get our habits to stick? My intention today is to demystify habit building, to identify the habits that amplify performance, and then to look at the habit habit hacks of top performers so that you can get an idea of what types of habits really increase performance. So a little bit about who I am. I'm an executive life coach and career consultant for young leaders, entrepreneurs, and high achievers or unfulfilled overachievers is is how I like to uh, label a lot of my clients because they're people who are in positions of leadership, they have their own business, they're used to performing under pressure, but they want to increase something else in life, their their joy, their happiness, their ability to manage teams, persuasion, all of those things. I'm also, uh, slides don't seem to be advancing on my end. Okay, let me let me stop share for a second. I'm going to share again, see if this helps. All right. Oh, that no looks the slides advance. Why don't you try moving it forward? Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay, great. Sometimes sharing my Zoom or sharing my screen after I pull up the presentation works and doing it the other way around doesn't. Zoom's strange. Anyways, technology. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Emily. 
Okay. So a little bit more about me. I'm a professional certified coach. I was a coach trainer for about six years, meaning that I trained other coaches how to coach at a high impact, high performance, high quality level. And I've been producing webinars, workshops, doing team coaching for a while now, for about seven years. Before that, I was in recruiting, team building, and HR. So I've always been interested in helping human behavior, help change, uh, helping to change habit formations and really understand what makes people effective. So if you're interested in getting some freebies after the session, I'm gonna be sending out a couple of different things, including my own um, three steps to go from resistance to performance, as well as the slides from the PowerPoint. So if you'd like to receive those, feel free to drop your email in the chat box and I'll send them out afterwards. All right, so let's start with the importance of healthy habits. So in general, there has been a very large increase in the amount of stress and interruption. So we've had, oh my gosh, since last March, it's been crazy, right? I mean, how many things have changed for us? Our jobs, our lives, our locations, our technology, uh, we've become uh, much more sedentary. There's health issues, there's money issues. There's so much stress going on in our lives. And stress reduces our ability to follow through, to focus, and to keep habits in place. And keeping habits in place are the very things that help to provide a sense of safety and security. Habits actually provide us with a self-soothing. It, it provides us with, with safety, with security, because we, we create a predictability by forming habits. So when we're stressed, it becomes even harder to focus than usual because of all the unknowns. We're, we're swimming in our stress and we're in our, our basic brains, our amygdala, and it's so much harder to focus when we're in that fight, flight, or freeze, which tends to send us in survival. And so if you're in survival for an extended amount of time, you become exhausted. And if you're feeling exhausted, you're in this survival stress loop, this one, two, three, four that we're pointing out here. So as the vaccine comes out and as we're starting to reintegrate ourselves into uh, other ways of life, we need to reinvent. And as we're rebuilding back to our new normal, there are people who are rising faster and faring better than others. These are the high performers that even if they were rocked by the lockdown, have the foundations to rise. So what are high performers? We're gonna talk about high performance and high performers a lot today. High, performance, high performers, and this is thanks to Google's help and definition, high performers are people who exceed expectations or are able to obtain unprecedented or unusual results. And high performers tend to be able to do three things in life, achieve more than the normal, be resilient against setbacks, and they're able to create more joy. Three things I think a lot of us want, right? So I wanna get into a little bit about habit anatomy before we get into the secrets of, of top performers. So, the anatomy of habits and routine go like this. There's some sort of reminder, like, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm tired. We then have a craving, like, I don't want to be tired. We then respond with a behavior, like, I'll have more coffee. And then there's some sort of reward, like, I'm less tired now that I have more coffee. So, if you are similar to me and similar to the normal person and you reach for, let's say, caffeine or some sort of energy, something in order to give yourself a kick, then you get this. And consider that you've conditioned yourself to automatically reach for something that fixes the problem but doesn't actually create a new foundation. We can get emotionally and behaviorally conditioned for things, not just a way of doing, but a way of thinking and a way of being. So when we talk in the coaching that I do about creating a new life and new leadership skills, new 
business habits, what we're really looking at is the foundation is our way of thinking that changes our habits, that that changes multiple things at once, not just I'm less tired for the day because I drank some coffee. BJ Fogg, who's an author of Tiny Habits, says, give motivated people the ability to act right then and there, and that's all you need in order to change a habit. Now, strong habits are actually built when we can create a new action from the cue. I'm tired, so therefore, blah, blah, blah. I'll get coffee or whatever it is. So when we have a reminder of something that has us doing that old habit, then instead of doing that old habit, we interrupt it and go, okay, I'm going to try something different. Instead of I'm tired, I'm going to grab coffee. Why don't I meditate for five minutes or go for a walk or take on a project that really excites me? So one very easy example of this is that oftentimes when we think we're hungry or tired, we're actually dehydrated. So when we're able to cognizantly fill our bodies with, with water and hydrate ourselves, we will then be able to be less tired and less hungry. But you have to interrupt that reminder. You have to interrupt the trigger and create a new routine. That's an example. Another example of this is uh, social media. So instead of reaching for social media when you're when you're bored or you're stressed or need a distraction, try interrupting it with something else and practice this. This is an interesting habit for people who are on social media. And if you're not on social media, I applaud you. You have uh, been able to escape modern day pressures and comparison. But instead of reaching for social media, try doing something different. Try reading a book or drinking water or standing up and walking around a little bit. But that's a, uh, that, that's a really easy practice to take on, especially for someone uh, who's looking to get more sleep at night, being able to put social media or screen time aside and simply uh, have a bedtime routine. All right, that's habit anatomy, how habits are created. Any questions so far about habit creation, about the stress loop, feel free to pop it in the, pop it in the chat box and I'll answer it as I go. Thanks everyone for, for your comments so far and dropping your, your email in there too. Okay, so let's talk about high performance habit how-tos. It's a lot of H's in that title. On average, it actually takes 66 days to build a new habit. And the range is between one to eight months of building a new habit. So my point here is to have patience. Creating new habits, especially high-performing habits, is about practice and progress rather than performance. Pun intended. That's a fact. Yeah, one to eight months. But here's the interesting thing about high performers. They have high standards and big goals, right? They set those goals, but they focus more on progress than on the end line and on the goal line. So a lot of creating new habits are trial and error, figuring out what works for you. Because there isn't just a one top habit hack that everyone needs to do and then they are high performers forever and ever. It really depends on your lifestyle, what works for you, your environment, how you functioned in the past. But usually success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. Clues for yourself and clues from, other, from others. So take a look if you're thinking about creating better, better habits or high performing habits, when have you performed at your highest in the past? What were some of the routines, the environments, the support systems that created this? I was a high performing soccer player at a young age. I, I was on this an incredible travel soccer team in New Jersey, which produced all these you know, female Olympic soccer players like Carly Lloyd. And um, we traveled all over the place and I oftentimes look back on the habits that I formed as a, a, a young woman playing soccer because I was quite I was quite successful, and I was able to fit all these things in. And so when I look back on my success in my own life, even starting from a young age, my success left clues. Now 
You can also look to people like Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins, Oprah, Michelle Obama, CEOs, and they all have some sort of habit that they speak about, like meditation, visualization. Tony Robbins has this incredible morning routine and habit of getting up and meditating and working out and then doing a cold plunge and all these really interesting things. But success and high performance habits leave clues. A great book that I'd recommend for people who are looking to increase their own performance is The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. And he studied high performance by examining talent hotbeds all over the world. What he says is that greatness isn't born, it's grown. And everyone can develop a talent with the right mix of practice, motivation, and coaching. So high performance isn't just a, it's not just a thing that you're born with. It's a thing you can actually practice. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before I get into the, the five secrets is that I want to attribute a few things that have helped me to form my own habits. Thanks, Joelle. Thanks, Sandra, for dropping your email there. By the way, for anyone who joined late, feel free to put your email in the chat box and I'll send some freebies that I have afterwards. I'll talk about my freebies in, in just a second, actually. So some of the things that have attributed to my own high performance habits include, like I mentioned, uh, being able to um, perform athletically from a, from a young age. And I was a student athlete too. I scored high in, in, uh, on tests and in school. My habits started at a young age and I've had many years of forming good, self-motivating, self-dedicated practices and habits. Now there's some natural motivation for excellence and resiliency that some people are conditioned to have, but most of my knowledge actually comes from a combination of knowledge that I've accumulated from people like James Clear, BJ Fogg, and Brendan Burchard. Brendan Burchard wrote the book, High Performance Habits. So easy book title to remember from this webinar. It's a great book, uh, but I've been following these people for, for about seven years. And I credit them a lot to the knowledge that I have around uh, teaching habits. So um, another thing I wanted to let you know is that I also did a healthy habit building webinar, which is basically the basics of creating healthy habits and creating a solid lifestyle. So if you're interested in receiving that, I'll also send out that option in the email afterwards if you want access to that webinar. And I also have a bonus chapter to James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, called Atomic Habits in Business. So I'll send that out afterwards as well in the email. All righty, well, let's get into it. The five secrets to high performance habits. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. <laughs> All right, so the five habits are purpose, producing energy, focusing on process, having a powerful mindset, and partnership. And we'll get into these in detail. All right. So the first secret to high performance habits is creating purpose. Now, high performers create purpose in all areas of their lives, like with morning routine, in work, in friendships, in hobbies. So as a coach to high performing women, especially, I often focus on multiple areas in life, because if you're just creating purpose in one area, let's say work, then it's actually not useful. You, you are very much limiting your ability to, to create this habit of purpose. And purpose is really about the pursuit of the inquiry of what am I doing here or what does this mean to me? If you've heard of the book, A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, this is very thematic in the book, in that book. He has this wonderful quote that goes, he who has a strong why can get through anyhow. And so again, with high performers, it's not that they have purpose in everything they do, but rather they seek it, they're curious about it. They're in the inquiry constantly of, am I on track? Am I living my mission? Am I honoring my values? So by asking this question, by, by looking and seeking purpose, you're actually strengthening direction 
commitment, confidence, and self-awareness. So people who are in the inquiry of, okay, what does this actually mean? What's the bigger commitment? What's the, what's the purpose here? What legacy am I leaving? They're actually generating more confidence because they're looking for their purpose. They're looking for passion. They're looking for something that calls them forward in everything they do. Um, Oprah actually begins every meeting with the question, what's our intention and what matters? Which is kind of a cool, uh, kind of a cool habit. So in Building Better Habits, the, the other webinar, I talk about identity being the very first step to creating better habits. Identity is a version of purpose. If you have a higher purpose, like I'm on the planet to change systemic racism or to interrupt burnout for women, your identity might look like I'm the type of person that interrupts burnout and that seeks the ability to better serve my clients. And then you set your routines based on being that person. So ultimately, if you want to achieve a goal, work on becoming the person who has the lifestyle that meets the goal. It's not about a goal, but becoming a better person. So here's one of the things I, I would love for you to take away. This is why habits don't stick. We spend no time forming a new identity and all our time forcing ourselves to do the things that are counterintuitive to an old identity. So for instance, here's a common example. If I believe I'm lazy, I'm gonna act lazy. But if I believe I'm a person who works hard and perseveres through anything, I actually have this uh, very deep-seated belief that I'm stubborn. <laughs> I'm Italian, so kind of comes with the territory. Then I'm the type of person that can get through anything tough. So instead of focusing on a goal, again, focus on the type of person you want to become. For instance, I'm the type of person that rarely misses a workout. That's a common uh, example that James Clear uses. So I mentioned the secret sabotage. In general, focus on purpose-driven actions and seeking clarity around what that looks like on a daily basis, Make, making choices according to the consistent actions and lifestyle of that person. And some questions to ask yourself is, how do I need to behave in order to meet that goal? What would that type of person who already does those habits do on a regular basis? So for each secret, I have a couple of boxes to concentrate on on the right-hand side. So the first thing to look at, if you're interested in creating more purpose for yourself in life, and you want to become a, a high performer in certain areas, this is an audit that you can do around purpose. So ask yourself these questions. And if you're interested in, um, in any secret in particular, I encourage you to take a screenshot and to take these on as practices, as journaling practices. So some questions. What does your ideal self look like in, your, in this situation? How can I leave it all on the field today? That really creates purpose, right? How can I leave it all on the field? What skills do you want to develop and demonstrate? This also creates purpose. What kind of skills do you want to generate at, at work that will carry through no matter what it is that you do beyond that? And what type of service will you be providing? And service, I mean, not just customer service, but service to the world, the betterment of the world. There we go. So some example, uh, examples of high performance purpose habits include having an agenda for every meeting, stating your team's mission and vision, keeping a journal and writing your year and monthly goals daily, and Sunday night intention setting and planning for the week. This creates purpose. You get to take a look at what you're up to all week. You get to seek out what really brings you meaning. Who here resonates with the, with the creating purpose? Or if you want more purpose in your life, who's like aching for a little bit more purpose? <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. And interestingly enough, purpose is one of those things that it's on a spectrum. It's not like you have, you have it or you don't. It's, okay, how much purpose do I have in this? 
because there's always a purpose to what we do. It's just a matter of getting curious as to what, what that is, even if it's a, well, I want to like feel better about myself or I want to avoid looking stupid or I have to do this because my boss told me to. It's always a purpose. All right, moving on to secret number two, producing energy. In Brendan Burchard's book, High Performance Habits, his research shows that most people lose energy throughout the day and are generally wiped by 2 to 3 p.m., but not high-performance people. Now, why is that? Why do you think that is? He did a whole bunch of research. He, he ended up gathering data through Gallup, through uh, Princeton University, and found that it's because high performers have mastered transitions, meaning going from one thing to the next without losing energy. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, that's great. Feeling like you you default to automatics versus doing things purposefully. Absolutely. I, I think this just makes you human. <laughs> I mean, most of the time we're living in automatics as human beings anyways. We live most of our lives from automatic, from our subconscious, from routines and habits, even if they're bad habits. So there are actually three pillars to producing energy. Number one is to simplify. The second is to take breaks. And the third is creating boundaries. Let's talk about these. Simplifying, how do you produce energy? The first thing is to simplify. The most important, okay, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quote, I actually don't know where this quote came from. I heard it from a friend a couple years ago and I will never forget it. The quote goes, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. Meaning, find your priority, find the number one thing that's most important and keep it most important. We often overcomplicate everything, having multiple calendars, multiple social media accounts, multiple lists, multiple ways of organizing. There's so many options out there that we oftentimes will thin ourselves out. Challenge yourself instead to do one thing for each thing or have one thing. I, I've always challenged myself to keep one calendar and one to-do list. Now, another thing is something that James Clear introduces, which is called Keystone Habits. And a Keystone Habit is a routine or ritual that naturally pulls your life into line and creates a cascade of good behavior. So for me, it's that list. Every single day, I sit down to my desk before I do anything, before I work, and I make one list that combines today's most important priority work items, personal items, and my weekly goals. So I make one list and I go, okay, what are my weekly goals? What are today's work items and today's personal items? And then I prioritize it. Okay, what's the first thing that needs to get done? Second, third, whatever it is. And then I time block my calendar out if I haven't already from that one list. And that behavior sets me up so well. I'm so organized <laughs> on a daily basis for that reason only. All right, Keystone Habits complete. The second thing is to take breaks. So if you've heard of the Pomodoro method, then you really get this. The Pomodoro method goes like this you either uh, work for 25 minutes and take five minutes off or work for 50 minutes and take 10 minutes off. And that five to 10 minute break really helps you to digest information. We live in a world that's going nonstop based around consuming and producing more. And on the one hand, it's great. But on the other hand, it saps mental and emotional energy. So in order to operate at our best, we have to recharge. And digestion, taking that time to clear our brains, moves the energy and resets our mind so we can focus on the next. The more you digest, the more energy, creativity, and elevation you'll have. And interestingly enough, by taking a five-minute break, you are saving yourself time because it takes roughly 20 minutes to refocus when you're switch tasking than if you're being proactive. 
Lisa asks, one of the challenges is prioritizing the list because it feels like it takes too long. Well, I'm wondering how, how you're listing things out. For me, it takes less than five minutes to make a list on a daily basis. Or do you mean checking things off the list? If it's checking things off the list, then my suggestion there is to not feel like you have to complete everything. And actually going back to the simplification, what I look at is, okay, if I get nothing else done today, what is the one thing that if I accomplish this, I will consider today a success? And I put that first and I work on that first. That's my priority. So if you're struggling, Lisa said a combination of both, I guess. This is a great question, by the way. If you're struggling with sitting down to make a list, then there's some sort of subconscious behavior or belief that's preventing you from taking five minutes because it should be very quick. It should be five minutes. I challenge yourself to set a timer for five minutes, do the best you can in making a list of what you need to do that day and not going past five minutes, just using the list that you have. So if you're struggling with that, then look at the subconscious belief. What's the what's the thing that's running the belief that by not making the list you're somehow doing more because that's just not true by setting yourself up for success you're focusing more you're prioritizing more you're playing the long game instead of the impulse what do i need to what do i need to do right now right now right now that that's at least the way that my brain works and the way that most people's brain works when it comes to scheduling and organizing. Our brains are like, okay, well, what can we do right now to get that quick hit of achievement? But this is really about the foundation, the long game. Prioritizing for the week versus the day. The one thing for the day that makes it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lisa said what you said about the one thing for the day makes it much more manageable. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see, what is next? Boundaries. Okay, Bound the last thing I want to talk about here is boundaries. So some examples of boundaries that high performers use are time blocking, calendar blackouts, meaning no meetings, no calls, this is my creative time, saying no more, as in limit your on time and expand your creative time, and create mandatory lunch breaks away from your desk. This aids the digestion, right? And it creates some boundaries too. It teaches you to, to generate boundaries and to keep you know, your, your life and your ability to move energy away from needing to pour out. Emily said, I think for me, I start the list and as I come across things that are urgent, I start doing those. I need to stay with the list until it's all there. Oh my gosh, Emily, I totally understand. And this is something I had to really train in myself. And luckily I've had a lot of, uh, had a lot of experience in my early athletic days in basically saying no to myself or overriding my impulses. And that's really what we have to teach ourselves. Just like we, you know, a, a small child would learn for those moms out there, I'm sure you understand. It's, it's about training yourself. It's about training to put down those immediate impulses and step back and look at the big picture. So that's what we're doing. We're retraining ourselves to, to think big picture instead of impulsively. All right. For those interested in an energy audit, here are some questions to ask yourself. Look at where you're multitasking or task squishing. <laughs> Emily, this is, I think this was written for you. <laughs> where are you multitasking when you need to be staying with that list or with the priority? Notice where you're saying yes when you actually need to be saying no. What would you need to have in order to have sufficient breaks in the day? Where can you delegate? And where can you unreasonably simplify? I like that word, unreasonable. Here's an example of energy habits for high performers. They block out their calendar and have blackout times. I work with a... Um, a woman who's uh, head of recruiting at a very, very large company. And this is one of the first things that we worked on is where, where are you able to create blackout periods where you can work on higher level things, where you can say no to email, no to calls, no to meetings, 
can absolutely positively work on what you need to work on. And it's so necessary when it comes to high performers because you need that time to think creatively. They also use the Pomodoro method. They take breaks. People who are high performers also have meditation or digestion breaks. They have lunch, they walk around the block, they take five minutes and they, uh, they get up from their desk and they stretch. Another thing that I worked on with this client is also limiting meetings. So having a no more than meeting limit, no more than four meetings a day, that's it. And they also schedule breaks of joy, connection, and creativity. All right, that's producing energy. We'd love to hear your thoughts there as well. Thanks, Emily, Lisa, Brittany, for put, putting in what you put in. Now, the third secret, process. The number one myth to high-performing habits is the belief that you have to change overnight. There's a saying that goes, it takes years to become an overnight sensation. <laughs> and it's true, we set our sights on a goal, we, we become attached, and then we believe we have to be an immediate success in order to achieve it. Instead, play the long game. Creating new habits and increasing performance is something that is not done overnight, something you have to commit to for the long run. So get more focused on the repetition and the process rather than the event itself. So here's a practice for you. If you're interested in um, learning patience with the process is to start thinking five steps ahead. Start thinking five steps ahead. And then align yourself with those five steps. And I'm, and I'm talking about a big project. For instance, um, when me and my husband bought our condo and we were first, first time homeowners, I took a look at, okay, what are the next five things that need to happen? And what do I need to focus on in order to complete those five things? And for me, it was organization. I absolutely needed some sort of document to keep myself organized. Who, would I, who do I need to call? When do I need to call them? Who are the people that I need to be in touch with? We were redoing some things here. How do I uh, keep, keep my uh, contractors on track and make sure that they're communicating with me? So think five steps ahead and start to build skills for those five steps. We asked, how do I make sure I don't make a list which stresses me too much? I usually fall into this trap. Well, it depends on what the what you're making the list mean. Oftentimes, when we if we're stressed out from the list, it means that we're relating to it as something we can't achieve. Or if we don't achieve everything on the list, we're somehow not enough or we're wrong or we didn't do a good job or something. Consider that list making is simply a way to support yourself and to keep yourself on track. And again, have that list be a reminder of what's important to you to keep yourself on track. So what helped me with my uh, list game is again, that thought of if I can just accomplish one thing and cross it off today, what would that one thing be? And focus on that one thing. And if you accomplish it, great, move on to the next one. But yes, it is a reframing practice. Some people really don't like lists because it reminds them of all the things that they haven't done that they need to do. And therefore, whatever belief you insert belief here, that's actually the thing to work on. Because whether you're making a list or not, you're still thinking that in your subconscious. The list just makes that belief a conscious thing. And then you get to work on reframing that belief. Yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. And if you're not a list person, you're not a list person. You figure out what works for you. Maybe it's reminders in some other format. Maybe it's hiring a, an assistant. All right, so here, as far as process goes, do things you can sustain. So we think that in order to do a grand thing, we have to do grand things daily. No, small improvements. So, yeah, you're welcome, me. The last thing I want to say about process is that when we're in process, we forget to reward ourselves for the actions that we take. 
And here's the thing, when we reward ourselves in little ways, our brain will automatically rewire ourselves to want to do that habit again. For instance, BJ Fogg talks about his flossing habit. He wanted a flossing habit. So what he did was he, he would floss one tooth a day or he would, uh, he would you know, just focus on flossing for 30 seconds. And every time he picked up the floss and he used whatever amount he used for however amount of time he used it, he would pump his fist in the air and go, victory, which is kind of cute. It's a little like pokey, but the, the point with this is it gave his brain a, a hit of dopamine saying, good job. The reward is such an important part of the habit forming process. All right, let's look at a process audit to become more masterful, masterful at being in process. So take a look at the daily practices that you can take on, that you can sustain for a long period of time, like flossing or making your bed or reading one page in a personal development book every day or meditating for five minutes using the Calm app or going for a 10 minute walk. All of these are process oriented. Uh, what are the next five goals I have and the skills I need for them? What are the little ways I could reward myself daily? And look at where you're sabotaging process by expecting home runs. For, for people who are uh, troubled by the list making, this is usually it. You're expecting home runs, you're expecting to get through everything, and you're not going to, like, the point in a list isn't to get through everything all the time. It's just a reminder. It's a reminder system so you don't have to rely on your brain all the time for everything. It's not reliable. All right, some habits. Work on a foundational skill. For me, this was meditating every single day when I started my coaching practice. Another habit is to have SMART goals, but also milestones that build. So my SMART goal was to be able to meditate for 30 minutes and be really in the zone. So I started with a three to five minute meditation every single day for a month. Definitely built up the habit and it helped my ability to be present and focused. That was so cool. Remove distractions and simplify and have a weekly recap on all that you accomplish. This is one of my favorite things to give to high performers is every Friday you sit down and you make a list of all the things that you've accomplished that you're proud of, even the small things. All right, friends, list some more questions out if you have any questions. Thanks for all of your engagement. I'm gonna keep moving because there's still some more slides here. So number four, powerful mindset. I love this quote from the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari. He says, the modern, the modern human tension is that we have stone age emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology, meaning mindset is everything. So mastery over our minds matters because otherwise we're living from our prehistoric brain. 10% of life is what happens to us and 90% is how we respond to it. It looks like I doubled up on my bullet points here. So high performing people challenge themselves and challenge others to learn new ways of thinking, not necessarily new ways of doing. So this is the philosophy behind thought leadership. I don't know if you've heard of that, that word or phrase. It's huge in my industry, in the coaching industry. Thought leadership, thought leadership. What does that actually mean? It means getting other people to think differently, not necessarily do differently. Because once you, yeah, mindset is everything, right, Brittany? So once you shift your mindset, everything else shifts because your perspective is now different. Mindset mastery is about having resilience to the automatic thought patterns inside your head that leads you to automatic behavior patterns. Remember I talked about identity, right? That is mindset. That's changing your mindset and changing your way of being. So practice resiliency, practice having a powerful mindset. High performing people tend to do things like honor the struggle that, that they're in, that it's part of the process, right? All these habits are building on each other, by the way. So having a powerful mindset means being able to be in process, producing energy, practicing and expecting and welcoming breakdowns. 
They have patience through the process and embrace it as character building, right? Uh, we, I think Emily had the question of, uh, well, I honestly forget what the question was, but we were, I think I mentioned that uh, we're training our brains um, oh, yes, to come back to that main list, right? So we're training our brains to uh, to be uh, to play the long game, to be dis disciplined. We have to say no to ourselves and our childlike brain every once in a while. High performing people also don't complain about the struggle, but seek the benefit. And they know what it's all for. They go back to that purpose. Okay, what's the purpose of this? Let me remind myself of why am I getting in the habit of list making? Oh, that I remember now. It's so that I can, you know, have a bigger life, have a better life, have a more organized life. That's what's important. And they also consider there are other people less fortunate who struggle more but still achieve more. So perspective taking, right? Oops. There we go. Mindset audit. Lisa says, it's really easy to give up when you lose patience from the failures versus embracing, embracing them. Ugh. Preach, preach queen. That is so, so true. So yes, embracing failure and even not even seeing it as a failure. I mean, what is failure anyways? It's so objective. We, we all have different points of view on what failure is and people aren't failures. It's simply what we do, what we expect, and then what happens right? So mindset audit. Where are your emotions getting the best of you? Where might you feel overwhelmed or burdened or bitter? And if someone with a masterful mindset were in my place, what would they think or do? These are some easy questions to take a look at how to create a, a more powerful mindset, or where in your life you might generate a more powerful mindset. And here are some mindset habits of high performers. Uh, so the Dalai Lama always says that if you are stuck in one particular point of view, challenge yourself to seeing that thing, that situation, that person, or that belief from seven different lenses. And he teaches that to other, uh, other Buddhists. I challenge my clients to think of the same situation, but from three different perspectives. If you're like, Oh, that person's a jerk. Why did they do this to me? Okay, what are three other ways of interpreting that situation that happened? Also, ask questions instead of giving answers. If you're a leader, if you manage a team, focus more on questions and getting your team to think rather than just solving the problem for them. I love the question. This really helps to reframe things. How is this happening for me instead of to me? Lisa, what you said about uh, it's easy to give up when you lose patience from the failures versus embracing them. This is a great, great question. How is this happening for me? Also have one place in your life where you work on mental toughness. The last thing I popped in here is use the warm-up ritual worksheet. This is my worksheet on uh, the three steps to go from resistance to action. So I will also send that out in my email. All right, secret number five, we're almost there, partnership. It's my quote, follow through is hard when partnership is absent. And I have found this to be incredibly true, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. And my profession of life and leadership coaching was born, born from this need for partnership and accountability. You cannot stick with a habit unless you have a support system with yourself or with others. And I have my own follow through recipe here, which is equal parts structure, equal parts partnership, and equal parts practice. Oh, another doubling up of, of uh, bullet points here. But one very easy way to create accountability is to set intentions, to write something down. If you write something down in, in what you're intending to do, let's say for the week or for the day, you are three times more likely to do it. As in this week, I will go to the gym on Thursday at 5 p.m. and I will set a calendar reminder. By writing it down, you're three times more likely to do it. So I'm gonna go through support structures in just a second, but support structures are not mysteries. The most important thing is to make a declaration, know that you will be uncomfortable, and have structures and reminders sufficient to your resistance. 
So some partnership questions, who can you hire or who can help you hold, hold you accountable? Brittany, on point, the, the whole structure of on point is meant to be a partnership structure. Ask if you're scheduling everything and you're adhering to it. And if one reminder doesn't work, how many reminders do you actually need? Do you need six, seven, 10? Sometimes it's just a matter of setting more than one reminder. All right, here are some partnership structures. The first is to schedule things out. The second is to set boundaries, say no to things. The third is to create reminders, as many reminders as you need. Keep statements where you can see them, reminders where you can see them. And activate partnered accountability. So take a look in your own life right now. What are some ways of holding yourself accountable currently? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your calendar? Is it on point? Is it your lists? What are ways that you are held accountable? Accountability breeds responsibility, said Stephen Covey. All right, last thing I'm gonna do is to go through the top 10 habit hacks of eventual millionaires. This is fun, right? The first habit is to design your environment. Environment is the single most important thing that forms habits in the long run. So basically, if you are, uh, I know Brittany's gonna love this, if you are looking to cut out sugar in your diet and during your lifestyle and your whole house is surrounded by sugar, then you'll probably relapse. <laughs> environment is everything. So arrange the environment to make it easier to promote good behavior and harder to promote bad. A lot of high performers uh, you'll find really seek sounds a little silly, but seek houses and offices that have a lot of natural sunlight. Why is that? It promotes uh, a good environment for many reasons. The second habit hack is uh, visualization and journaling. All top athletes comment on how visualization is the key to any good performance, right? Because if you visualize it, your body will automatically start to think and follow through. Third is mastering your mindset. We talked about that in secret number four. Prioritize rest and exercise. 97% of adults feel better after exercise according to psychology today. So it makes you feel good. It adds energy. Ah, making mistakes. Yes, experiment. Be creative. Take some risks. Calculated risks. You know, don't, don't flush all your money and life down the toilet, but take a look at, okay, well, you know, what, what is something I want to challenge myself to? And be okay embracing failures. I love what Lisa Voss, Voss I hope I pronounced that right, said about it. All right, eliminate excuses. Know that 10% of life is what happens and 90% is how we respond. We can control our attitude and actions. So this has you be responsible for your life instead of being a victim. Ask more questions. We talked about uh, being curious, right? Being curious, being reflective, mastering your mindset. Take constructive uh, creativity breaks. Go outside, have free space. Um, enjoy yourself, <laughs> find joy. Vigorously sharpen the saw, says Stephen Covey, the, author's, the author of Seven Habits of High, Highly Effective People. So always look for where you can improve your character, your thinking, or your actions. The last thing, surround yourself with people smarter than you. This is something that I have done my entire life to my detriment. I would intentionally move myself up, challenge myself to compete against people uh, above me, beyond me, better than me, and it would help me to rise to performance. So a couple of examples of strong habit formation is, is Tim Ferriss. He has five morning rituals that get him into a productive state of mind. He makes his bed, he meditates, he exercises, he has a tea drinking ritual, and he journals. A lot of uh, high performers will have some sort of routine around this and then intersperse it throughout the day. And if you're an entrepreneur, 
uh, show me a video. Uh, yes, if you're an entrepreneur, here are some other daily habits of most successful entrepreneurs. We're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this today. But I want to end on the idea that practice makes progress. So take a screenshot of this. You can go back to the slides once I send them out and pick up one new practice or one habit that you want to take on, one of the secrets. All right, so your turn. What are you taking with you? Or what are you taking on? I'm gonna put up the gifts and takeaway. What questions do you have or what really resonated with you today? It's gonna give us a, a couple of minutes. And again, if you haven't already dropped your uh, email into the chat box, oh, it looks like I can't save the chat. Ooh, I'll just take some pictures of the emails, okay. Uh, Very cool, very cool. Sorry, just give me one minute. Do some housekeeping. Ah, ye, thank you, thank you. Wonderful, okay. The routines that successful people have, yeah. Oh, cool, thanks, Jeff. What challenges do you see people have the most in getting into new habits? It's not having enough accountability or structure for sure. Uh, it's easy to get in our own heads. It's easy to just go fall back on old habits. I think that's why the coaching industry is so darn prolific um, because it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary nowadays. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop share. And then I think I'm going to hand it back over to Brittany. Brittany, Brittany. I think I can talk. I'm not sure about a video. Oh, how do I allow your video? I wish we had more time. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> this is so, so lovely. Let's see if I can. Now. Allow to multi -pin. Make host. There we go. Change, change oh, host. Here I am. Wait. And I'm back. Okay. So I wish we had more time here. This was so enlightening. This was great. For everyone who's here and then anyone who you might know who has signed up but didn't show up, you'll all be getting an email with Lisa's contact information and a recording of this webinar. So you don't have to rush to screenshot things. We're going to send you all of that material. Um, and then Lisa, did you get the emails that you needed or I can probably uh, I, give you the emails. That would actually be. <laughs> that, that would actually have be fantastic. Them. I took screenshots of everything, which is uh, uh, would take a little while to translate it. So yes, if you could send that to me, that would I'll, be lovely. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll take care of that <laughs> on the back end. But everyone will be getting yeah. materials from me, materials from Lisa, um, and it's been great. This was this was awesome. Um, but if anyone so has questions, you'll get Lisa's contact info by tomorrow. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night. Lisa, I'm sorry to rush you through at the end, but we could have done two hours, I mean, really. Easily, <laughs> yeah. I need to condense my slides a little bit more next time. This is no, so we need fun. to make longer webinar slots. That's what we need to do. Oh, I like um, that option. But well, it was lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I love the On Point community. We love you. So anyone who um, has questions, again, you'll get Lisa's info. You'll get an email from us. We've got you covered. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Have a good we'll night. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.